Now, back here at Myra, one of the main reasons for coming here is to explore the mysteries, so to speak, of road holding and handling. Modern cars, of course, have better, more sophisticated steering and suspension systems. Even so, they all have their limit. When they reach it, things can go badly wrong. So here are a few pointers on this difficult but fascinating area from our resident racing driver himself, Tiffany Dell. I learned to drive in one of these, a Morris Minor 1000. I soon learned to enjoy my driving and also a lot about handling and car control at wet roundabouts at only 15 miles an hour. With grip levels so low, what happened when you reached the limit not only happened at a safe speed, but was very predictable. Of course, handling and road holding have now become complex and frequently debated issues. Magazines, discussions amongst enthusiasts, and our own road tests here on Top Gear are littered with technical jargon like understeer and oversteer. It's important at the outset to distinguish between handling and road holding, or handling and grip as we'll term it. Grip is objective and relatively easy to measure. All you need is a test circle, some sophisticated instrumentation, a G-meter, and some engineers to interpret the results. The boxes on the sides of the car measure roll, and at the back, there's an accurate optical speedometer. Together, these give sufficient information to calculate the maximum level of grip a car can generate, and that's what's measured in terms of G-force. And it's a major concern to the neck muscles of Grand Prix drivers. Speed round the circle is gradually increased until the point the driver can no longer hold a steady circle. The G-force is pushing the car out, while the grip generated in the tyres is holding it in. Grip levels have improved over the years and vary with the car's sophistication. On the test circle, the miner can only maintain 29 miles an hour, producing 0.51 G. Nowadays, its modern successor can maintain 35 miles an hour, 0.77 G, with its improved tyres and chassis, while a modern supercar can reach 40 miles an hour and generate some 0.97 G of cornering force. The actual difference feels more than mere figures suggest. It's fairly easy, therefore, to measure grip alone. Handling, however, becomes important because real motoring is not all about driving around a circle at a constant speed. It's about speeding up and slowing down in response to applications of steering, brakes and accelerator. And different cars will handle in a different way, especially when the limit of grip is reached. Back on the wet roundabout with the miner, accelerate suddenly and the driven rear wheels will break away at quite a modest speed. The effect is for the car to steer at a far faster rate than you anticipate, so it's called oversteer. Because it's caused by applying the accelerator and therefore more power, it's called power oversteer. In the case of the Morris 1000, the oversteer isn't all that serious because it happens at such a slow speed in any case, it's easily controllable. With modern cars, the grip level is so high that you should never reach the limit on the public roads. It's important still, however, that we test the cars for their handling in case of an emergency avoidance situation or if the grip level of the road suddenly gets reduced by ice or perhaps muddy conditions. The greater grip generated by a modern high-performance car means that the limit is reached at a much higher speed the warning of any breakaway is far less, which means that the resultant slide is much harder to catch. Under power, the rear-wheel drive BMW has similar handling characteristics to the minor, but to cause oversteer in the dry needs brutal use of the accelerator. Take a wet corner and use the power unwisely, however, and the results can be pretty dramatic. In a straight line, all the tyre's grip can be used to gain traction and accelerate forwards. But while cornering, some must be used to counter the G-force. So, with the power going through the rear wheels, demanding too much traction while cornering causes them to lose their grip and allow the rear of the car to slide out of line. The oversteer effect. It pays to use the accelerator carefully in the wet, but if the back does step out, you need to steer into the skid, or in other words, turn the wheel in the opposite direction to counter the oversteer. To stop the car spinning round can require quick reflexes and quite a bit of rapid arm twirling for the average driver. Only rear-wheel drive can cause power oversteer, and BMW have fought long and hard against this image while still trying to retain the classic feel of rear-wheel drive. 
To this end, they've developed their Automatic Stability Control System, ASC, which limits the power to the rear wheels just before traction is broken and grip is lost. Now, full power, second gear, my foot absolute to the floor, and absolutely no oversteer. Even without ASC, modern suspension geometry is designed to overcome this most dramatic of handling conditions. Indeed, they tend to create the opposite effect, while much more natural to front-wheel drive cars, power understeer. With a front-wheel drive car on a bend, understeer can be caused by excessive use of power, demanding too much from the front tyres, which lose steering control when traction is broken. The front is now pushed wider offline in an understeer condition. Again, it can happen easily in the wet. Correction is simpler and less dramatic than with power oversteer. It's controlled either by adding a little more lock or, in severe cases, by lifting off the accelerator and, as grip is regained, reducing the excess steering. It's easier than oversteer correction and more natural for the average driver, but less satisfying for the experienced. The key to successful handling for the car designer is to ensure that whatever the car does, it gives the driver as much warning as possible and is easy to control. So far, we've only dealt with power-on situations, but oversteer and understeer are caused by two other things, varying the power input or varying the steering input. The most dramatic of these occurs in the transition from power-on to power-off while cornering. Taking your foot off the accelerator, or worse still, braking when entering a bend, can cause some cars to oversteer sharply and maybe spin. An exit curve from a main road, which forces a quick slowdown, is a typical danger area. Toyota's MR2 is one of the cars which has been criticised for this handling characteristic. At nearly 40 miles an hour on the test circle and near to the limit of grip, if you lift your foot off the accelerator, this is called lift-off oversteer. And, as we did with the BMW, it can be easily corrected by steering into the skid. Caused by having to compromise on suspension design and weight distribution, it's a characteristic I actually enjoy, but which can be difficult for the less experienced driver. The front engine, front wheel driver land with maximum grip as a major design criterion simply tucks in under the same test. It's corrected as before by easing off the steering. It is less dramatic and much easier to control than the Toyota, but for me, less entertaining. Mind you, it's important to stress that any car can be made to spin if provoked hard enough. Even the predictable Alain. And that's not a skid pad. So, we've seen that handling is, as expected, very much a matter of personal preference. Whether you prefer a car that's solid and predictable, or one that's frisky with a hint of character. But are they all safe? Perhaps all new cars should be put through their paces at an independent research centre, where handling faults may be unearthed and improvements recommended. Actual tests would be hard to define, but one used by some car manufacturers is the slalom test. This can show how well a car copes with sudden changes of direction. The Elan copes easily at 55 miles an hour, but a large saloon shows the strain at 50 miles an hour with the same 25 metre cone spacing. At 55 miles an hour, it's impossible. New developments which stiffen the suspension automatically under sudden cornering improve performance. So equipped, the Citroen XM can do almost as well as the Elan at 55. Mind you, however objective you make these tests, improvements in car handling and grip will still depend on the subjective views of the car buyer.